founder and CEO of Infragistics. He's going to talk about listen, think, create. Um, he's a tech CEO, and really his whole business is 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 all about innovation. And you're going to be really um, going to have a great presentation later. Uh, but I'm here real quickly to do uh, a commercial for for Icor at Rutgers, which is sponsoring today's event. And with me today is a, a bunch of the members of our teaching team. Um, Dunbar Burney, who's the PI on our grant, is here. Mark DeGuzman, our program director. Um, Dan Benderly, who's from Innovation Ventures. Uh, Elaine McLean is the director of the Small Business Development Center. Um, and Connie Pascal, who's going to introduce Dean. So th those are some members of our teaching team that are here today. And um, really, it's a, it's a team program. We, we all contribute to i and I want to thank them all for, for joining us today. So just a little bit about i I'm going to go through this really quickly. Um, it is a cohort-based program sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Rutgers received a grant, um, and we started running programs in 2018. The program is team-based, and typical teams have from two to five people, and Mark's going to explain the roles in a minute. And really, throughout the i um cohort, we, we train you about business concepts. And the people that, are, that participate in our cohort are faculty, staff, students, alumni. But one thing they all um, share is that they're all innovators and they're trying to move their innovation from, from point A to point B. Everybody starts at a different place and everybody may end at a different place, but what they're doing is really learning. Um, and that's because we provide information and guidance throughout the sessions. Um, but it's but it's a hands-on learning opportunity, and it's really about talking to customers. Um, that's really the foundation of ICOR is is the team going out and, and talking to people that um, have problems and and they want to understand about the problem and see if their innovation you know fits that space. And in order to do that, we give you some tools, um, specialized software which you have for three months. We also provide our teams with. Um, $2,500 reimbursement. It, it used to be for travel. Um, now it's used primarily for things such as LinkedIn learning, uh, online conferences, and professional associations, any, anything that really can help you um, to facilitate those interviews. And, you know, our teams, again, Mark's going to talk about the makeup of a team, but we can um, help you by matching you with mentors in some cases and or fellows, which you're also going to learn about in a minute. Mark? Uh, yeah, and so um, so I'm Mark DeGuzman. I'm the program manager of Rutgers i -Corps. I served as an entrepreneurial lead in the National i -Corps program. And this program came out of Steve Blank's uh, class from Stanford University, which is based on, um, you know, it leverages a scientific method through experimentation. Um, really, the idea is you want to go out and find out what the problems are in the market before you talk about your solution so you have a good understanding. And so that's why Steve Blank here on the right says that there's no facts inside of the building. You got to get outside the building. A lot of people build their uh, research in, in a silo. And so we want to make sure the scientists and the researchers get out there and meet with people to build something that people want. And that's why we call it evidence-based entrepreneurship through customer discovery. Go ahead, Laurie. And um, it's important that to note that this is, you know, entrepreneurship is like a team sport. Um, basically, in this in this program, we require at least two out of these three team members. Uh, the primary one is the entrepreneurial lead, who's the student um, who really understands, um, really has entrepreneurial spirit, really wants to understand the market opportunity. They understand the science of the technology, but they really want to go out and find out who the customers are and why. Uh, the technical lead, uh, this nutty professor here on the right, uh, this is kind of like the inventor or usually a faculty member or professor who really understands the science of the technology and understands what it can do. Um, but the entrepreneurial lead, entrepreneurial lead really is looking for who it is for. Um, but you, everybody works together. And the third person is the industry mentor, somebody from outside the university who can really guide the team to make warm introductions so that, these, so that the team can get the 25 interviews, which is required for our, for our site program. Um, and a lot of teams have difficulty getting this industry mentor, but we really want to help. So if there's a, there's a form you can fill out, if you, if you need an industry mentor, we can help connect you to one. And like I said, you need at least two to participate, um, but we can help with that. Great. So just a few quotes from some of our teams. Um, we had one of our faculty members say that the i program opened their eyes to um, something about their innovation that they really hadn't thought of, even though they've been working on it for over seven years. 
Um, and the, the number one thing we hear from students who participate is that they become more confident. That's from you know, students and our fellows. And just that there's a lot of cross-disciplinary interactions. We have teams from all over the university, any discipline, Camden, Newark, New Brunswick. Um, and you know, a lot of times the teams think they're going, they, they're coming in with one innovation. And after they start talking to potential customers, they realize that they need to change their prototype or even um, they may have a different customer segment. And then lastly, it's really, you know, learning about the market by talking to people who, you know, can influence the innovation. So um, really we've gotten a lot of great um, insights for our team members through i -Core. Um, And just a couple successes. And, and this is really doesn't even scratch the surface, but, um, you know, we've had over hundred teams go through the program so far, uh, 400 different participants. And through their interviews and insights, you know, they've gotten um, funding through SBIR, STTR. We just recently had our team from cohort two get a big um, grant of over a million dollars. Um, we've had teams get funding through BARDA. We've had University um, City Science Center awards to, given to our teams. Um, Rutgers funding, Tech Advance and Health Advance. Um, teams have gone through the National i -Corps program. And that's because they've really learned a lot through the i -Corps process. Um, and not only earn, you know, they, they're not only learning about the technology side, but they're really learning about the value um, that their innovation could give to society and, and really finding out what potential customers want. Our student teams have won a ton of competitions and business plans. Um, on the right here is a prototype at the makerspace that one of our teams, Airsys, has built um, using it for, for last mile delivery. So just, just so many. Um, successes that our, our teams have had. Um, and the fellowship program is, is something new that we created about a year ago for um, underrepresented groups to improve diversity and inclusion. And basically we give an opportunity for students to either participate on a team or help out our cohort. And it's really students that have, you know, typically a good GPA, they're mm -hmm. interested in innovation or they've had leadership positions but they may not be able to participate in a program like this because they need to get a job or something. So we give them a stipend and we give them the opportunity to join i -Corps and learn about innovation and entrepreneurship. And they, they've really been wonderful at helping the teams do interviews, do presentations and, and things such as that. Mark, you want to talk about applications real quick? Yeah, so um, you know, applications are open. Uh, we are recruiting now for the summer cohort, uh, which is going to be run from uh, July 12th to August 5th. So application deadline is, is June 1st, but it is rolling. So the earlier you apply, the earlier you'll be interviewed. Uh, we do have future cohorts as well. So um, please help us spread the word. Um, so that way we can um, get more people to know about i -Corp. Um, and fellowship also has a separate um, website. I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, but you know, if you have questions about it, just reach out to us. You might know someone. So if you know someone, you can send them our way or tell them, you know, tell them to watch this video or um, introduce them to us. Our email is here, icartresearch.rutgers.edu, and then Lori's email and uh, my email I'll put in the chat as well. Great. Thank but basically, you so much, we want to help you. Yeah. And now, yeah. without further ado, um, Connie Pascal is going to introduce our keynote speaker, what you're all here to see. Connie? Well, thank you, Lori. It is indeed my pleasure and a real honor to introduce uh, my friend, Dean Gaida, who is CEO and founder of Infragistics, a Cranberry, New Jersey-based software firm. And Dean is an experienced entrepreneur. He actually founded Infragistics in 1981 and grew the firm from a small two-person entity operating out of the bedroom of his uh, house into a worldwide leader in software design and collaboration tools, currently having offices, of course, here in the United States, England, Japan, Bulgaria, Uruguay, and India. Uh, and now uh, Infratistics, again, is, is a developer uh, and has a UX professional community of more than 1.4 million designers. And Infratistics has achieved and won um, the highest awards in software development. And they currently have over a million people using their enterprise mobility apps. So Dean's 30-year legacy as an entrepreneur is a testament to his passion and commitment to stay the course. And he currently oversees all 
aspects of Infragistics business operations and corporate direction. Dean is also a leader in the low code slash no code movement and an amazing friend uh, to Rutgers students. In the past six years, Dean has made his Indigo Studio design software product available to our students for free, giving over 2,500 students the opportunity to learn how to build their own software and websites. What you are about to hear is advice coming from someone who really knows what they're talking about. So without further ado, please welcome Dean Gaida. Well, uh, th thank you, Connie, and uh, thank you, Rutgers. And it's been a real pleasure working with Rutgers. It's, uh, it, it's always great to be around um, people learning and innovating and, and exploring. So what I thought I'd start off with, I'll, I'll kind of just give a little bit of history of founding Infragistics and like my entrepreneurial journey. And then I really want to share a lot of things we've learned over the last three decades around innovation and, and give some real um, practical, actionable uh, learnings and, and, uh, and share with you what we've learned. So, um, so I was, uh, we actually were founded in 1989. So we're, we're over 32 years old. And um, last week I was interviewed by uh, Forbes.com and, and they asked me, they said, you know, why, why did you become an entrepreneur? And it kind of started really early for me. So when um, I, I grew up in New Jersey, but then my parents got divorced when I was like six years old and I moved to uh, Miami, Florida. And so really early on, um, you know, I just saw my mom struggle a little bit and I was always trying to figure out, okay, how can I make money? And so when I was eight years old, you know, no one hired an eight year old, but um, I was able to convince the uh, maintenance man in our apartments to let me do his work and he paid me off book. And so really early on, I was always trying to figure out how to make money. And that was like kind of a really uh, driver to become an entrepreneur. And then later on, I, I really learned to love, uh, learn technology. And so when I was um, about 16, I was saving up money to buy a used car to, you know, take out girls like most 16 year old boys. But instead of buying a used car, I bought uh, an IBM PC. It was like one of the first IBM PCs. And it was so expensive. I mean, way back that many years ago, it was $4,500, but I decked it out and I just, I loved everything about it. And um, so I taught myself the program and, and, I, and I really found joy in uh, learning and being able to think of something and then, uh, and then create it through code and then see it come to life. And I went, um, so I worked all, all, through, um, all through college, all through high school. And um, I ended up, I went to University of Miami and while I was at University of Miami, I, I studied systems analysis, which is like deterministic and probabilistic uh, modeling. And I also got a degree in, in business. I didn't get a computer science degree because I felt that, you know, I kind of, you know, I learned so much before even going to college, how to write software. But while I was at school, I was on uh, the work study program for the VP of HR. And they had this $8 million a month payroll system and it didn't work. And I told him, hey, I, I could fix that. And he was like, you can't fix that. You know, we spent all this money on that. And I said, well, you know, w you have nothing to lose because you're paying me, you know, $3 an hour. Let, let me try. And um, so I, I did it and I fixed it. And he, he was so thrilled. And that's where I also just kind of found an intrinsic motivator myself, which is just doing things that people think you can't do. And then after doing something, you know, just seeing the, the delight and the glitter in their eyes and the happiness. And so, um, so after school, I moved up to New York City because I wanted to be with all the smart people. But, but what happened was like, that's where all the money was, but maybe all, all the smart people were at Microsoft or Borland um, and these other software companies. But I, I got a really great, great lesson in, in business. I worked down on Wall Street. I worked for IBM for a while and I was writing different enterprise systems. And um, I actually, one of the best teams I worked on was um, at AIG, an insurance company. And so myself and one other person from that team created Infragistics. But the other people on our team went on to create some other products that you may not have heard of or depending on how old you are, but um, Irwin, which is a database modeling tool. And, um, and, and it was just, just really great. So, so that's just my kind of short history into, um, you know, becoming an entrepreneur. And the other thing that stood out that, that I, I really want to encourage is you hear about the young entrepreneur getting a hundred million dollar funding or the young entrepreneur that got this amount of funding. And I'm kind of, um, which, which is a fine path to take, but the, the person at Forbes, when they were interviewing me, was like, 
yeah, you're, you're kind of unique. Like you didn't take any money. We're used to talking to these young kids with all this money. And um, so for the last 32 years, we've funded ourselves. Like we organically and through um, just grit and perseverance and, um, you know, have, have created a successful uh, company and products. And, and what I always tell our employees is that, you know, I don't pay you, our customers pay you. And so being so important to delight the customer, take care of the customer and, um, and deliver value and helpful value to, to the marketplace. So, um, so let me introduce a little bit in Phrogistics, um, some of our products, and then I wanna talk about the fabric of innovation. So at Infragistics, we build UX and UI tools that we sell to application developers and designers. And we sell to some of the, um, the biggest software companies out there and the smallest software companies to enterprises. And our tools have been used over the last three decades to build TurboTax, Quicken from Intuit. Um, we're really strong in the financial service market where most of the equity trading systems and risk management systems are being built with our tools at Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Bank of America, and a lot of other uh, financial institutions, including Fidelity, Charles Schwab. We're also, uh, we're used to build all the 911 systems in America, which is kind of interesting. And, and um, at IKEA runs a lot of their operations built with our tools. And Exxon has built a lot of uh, in interesting applications for oil exploration with our tools. So what we do is we build software for application developers to create the user interface. And then we also provide tools where you can prototype, do unmoderated usability tests, and collaborate around your ideas, get feedback from stakeholders and iterate on that before you have to write code. And then we generate the code. So, so our core business has been all, all around um, creating UX and UI tools for development teams. And one of the things that is so hard to do, but we talk about all the time, and, and I highly recommend it for everyone listening, is that um, when we talk about what's important in Infragistics, we talk about okay, creating simplicity and beauty and happiness in the world one app at a time. And it's so hard to do, and it, and it doesn't have to even be whether you're building software. It just, if you're really trying to create, uh, solve a problem, and if you could do it simply, beautifully, and have a really positive impact of whatever you're doing on somebody, it, it's just a really um, high bar to be thinking about. And, and it's kind of transcended everything we do and, and how we build software and how we sell it how we market it. And so I wanted to share that with you. And towards the end of the talk, I wanted to kind of share some other things that I think could be useful if you want to be an entrepreneur. So let me talk about the main, the main topic, which is, um, and as Connie said, we're, you know, we're a multinational company. I'll talk a little bit about that because that's one of the points about the fabric of innovation. And so the first biggest takeaway, probably the most important takeaway in this talk is that Everyone can be an inventor, everyone can be an innovator, and everyone can be an entrepreneur. And it's like this word that's so scary and magical, and it's not me and others can do it. It's, it's just not true. And the biggest barrier that a lot of entrepreneurs or innovators or people in general have is, is listening to your inner voice. You know, I say it all the time. Don't listen to your inner voice. Don't let that talk you out of not doing something. Don't don't listen to the naysayers because there's a thousand naysayers around new ideas and and innovation. And now you want to listen to them because they're going to have good ideas around problems or blockers in your idea. But don't let them not let you think about something, do something, create and keep learning to do it. So. I think that's like the biggest thing where people say to themselves, well, I had this great idea. And then, um, oh, and then someone went and created something and like, I had that idea. And so that, that that's like the single biggest thing I, I, I kind of want to communicate is that don't listen to your inner voice and, but, you know, think, do, and go out and, and try and um, solve some good problems out there. So, what are some of the things that we've learned over the last three decades? And I'm kind of calling it, you know, the fabric of innovation and how to nurture innovation is when you think of an idea, whether it's a vision for a company 
or it's a vision for a product or a service, what you need to do is you need to paint a picture of what it looks like once you've completed that innovation, that idea, that company. You know, how does it look? How does it feel? How will it make everyone better? And so you really have to really think through and 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 paint that picture of your vision, your innovation, your product. Because most of the time you need to bring teams and people along with you. And there's nothing more inspiring than for everyone to align and really understand where you're heading directionally and, and what you're trying to solve. And by doing that and talking in tones like affirmations, like saying when we, you know, really speaking to um, how it will be when you get there. So things like, you know, the best developers, designers, and tech companies use our products to build simple and beautiful applications. You know, really talking in affirmations and painting that picture of the future is another part of um, just driving innovation and kind of creating the space for innovation. The, um, the other thing that I've learned with 20, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, so it's diversity of thinking. And let me kind of explain what that is through, through a story. Um, about 21 years ago, I attended this uh, Center for Creative Leadership, and it really changed my life. I mean, it helped me have a better marriage, helped me be a better manager. And it was a, it's a really advanced program where they do all kinds of psychological tests on you. They interview your spouse, they interview your coworkers, they interview who you report to, your uh, who, who's reporting to you. And it's unbelievable how advanced psychology is. And, and what they do is they give you a kind of, they put you in these tough situations. They give you like experiential learning. So like it pulls out like the best and the worst in you. And you, you learn about, um, oh, my strength can be a weakness. And um, there, there was like, like two points to this. One is about diversity of thinking, but the other was where your strength can be your weakness. Like I really care about people. And I got, so I scored myself a five. And then I got, then everyone else scored me and they scored me a two. I was like devastated. I was like, how can I not, how can everyone score me so low? And, um, and, and what I learned was like, I'm a very kind of structured person and just trying to get things done. And so when I was working with teams and people, I was not very personable and I was just really focused on the task at hand. And, um, and, then, and then it was over. And so I kind of like gave this perception of not caring about people. So, you know, that's part of innovation is just self-awareness and reflection. And, um, and the, the big thing that I learned was the first day we were put, we're, we kept getting put on different teams. And there was this girl who was like crazy off the wall person. I'm like, oh man, I hope she's not on my first team, you know? And so of course the first, she's not on my first team. And, and, and we all went outside and uh, we had all these teams and we had to throw this ball around and talk about our best team experience. And then the coach said, okay, well, now I need you to do it in the same order, but do it in, 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 a, in a minute or two. So we're all like, oh man, like trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And then they come around and put pressure and you're like, what's wrong with you guys? Everyone else is done. Well, this girl thought differently. She was like, hey, let's all get in the same order of the way we threw it around randomly. And then we ended up like getting in the same order and we just kind of rolled the ball down our hands. And um, and then we did it within like 30 seconds. And, um, and so like the big learning for me is like, I used to hire everyone that thought like me, talked like me, and agreed with me. And it's unbelievable when you do that, how much you always solve the problem the same way. And so you really need to um, appreciate people that are different, think different than you, and you'll come up with great ideas and, and take a left turn and then build on that idea and then solve a problem in a better way. And so the old me would be like, oh, if I'm... Um, someone's in a meeting and they're not speaking up, they're not engaged, they don't care, or they have nothing to say. And, um, but after learning this, the new me was like, hey, everyone's different. People process information differently. They think differently. They have different personalities. And if you go to that person the next day and say, hey, what'd you think about that problem? You'll get amazing information. And so, um, so when we try and build teams, like diversity of thinking and just respecting different people the way they think, how they interact um, is, a, is a great way to create a, a space for, for innovation. And it was just a really, really big learning for me. Now, now it's a lot more difficult to run teams, 
like that because when everyone when everyone thinks the same and everything teams have more harmony and get along better but when you have different thinking and conflict like that you you know it's a little harder to manage but you will build and solve problems in in a much much better way and not always share the same thought process and how you're approaching problem and at infragistics we we purposely created a multinational company and so as connie said like we have dev teams in uruguay and montevideo we have dev teams in bulgaria and sofia bulgaria eastern europe we have dev teams here in new jersey and across the us and um and we purposely um and then we have teams, um, not necessarily dev teams, but we have teams in Tokyo and India and London. And um, But we purposely created a multinational company because we wanted to build software for the world and to take in those cultural uh, things that are, people are different all over the world. And so when you do that, you have better innovation, diversity of thinking, cultural thinking, and really trying to build software for the world and not be so myopic in oh, this is how we do it in the US, or this is how we do it in, in Europe, and, and, th and think broadly uh, from that point of view. <clears throat> the um, the other, other big thing in the fabric of innovation is, and you hear a lot, it's, it's a very, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a very popular topic now, but it's a critically important point is creating psychological safety and really the leaders and even the indirect leaders need to create this to create trust to really have a creative process to really make collaboration happen and so it's up to all of us to make people feel very comfortable about speaking up about sharing their ideas about sharing their point of view because it's really the only way not the only way but it's the best way to um solve problems and so um some, some ways that I use, and, and there's more than this, and, and I'm sure other ways, but like to create trust on a team, it's like, if you do what you say, that creates trust on the team, it, just by default, whether it's you're the leader or the team member, just doing what you say. Then the other is like showing up every day as your authentic self. Like, like I'm a big believer in, oh, you have to be you know professional. You shouldn't say this, you shouldn't show emotion. I'm not a believer in that. I'm a believer, you know, in, in the definition of that. Um, I'm a believer in you need to show up authentically every day. It's exhausting not to be yourself. And um, and you should show emotion. And and of course, you know, the, there's nuances to that. But, but you should show emotion. And it's just part of being human. And when you show up authentically every day, it creates trust. And people will trust you because you're, you're just being yourself. And the other is where you, um, like what we do as an executive team, we meet um, every Tuesday for two hours. And, um, and what we do is we, we all check in and we check in um, professionally, what's going on professionally, we also check in personally. And I can tell you, since we started doing that, our team has bonded so much better when you kind of share something personal. And, um, and you just bond with people because people are people and they're human and you, it creates that safety to trust someone and to speak up and to collaborate and to share. And um, so that, that's been a, another really important thing in, uh, in innovation and just running teams is just creating that trust. And, um, and you know, people could share a big thing personally, a small thing, or, but it, it, it's unbelievable how much of a bond that creates with people. And then uh, some more, more tips around um, creating trust on the team is you should publicly praise people and um but when you're doing coaching or something it should be privately and um and so and not just praise anything but praise a good work done and um and then celebrate together uh it, it's not always so easy to celebrate together whenever you can physically get together and celebrate if you can't physically get together then just celebrating wins and successes as a team and company and all of these things just help you deal with conflict, friction, pressure. Um, it, it's and and in the end, this is an innovation talk. But I got to tell you, it's fundamental in innovation. I mean, innovation most of the time should be a, is a team sport, and 
these are some important pieces to um, really to drive and create a space for innovation. Oh, and by the way, um, I forgot to say, uh, go ahead and put questions in the chat because at the end, then we're going to um, kind of go through the questions and answers. And also, you could also just kind of like speak up in the in the video and ask questions as well. But um, so, I'm, I'm, you know, we'll do that at the end. Um, so also, I wanted to share that, uh, you know, people talk about intuition and gut. And when I was early on, I wasn't so sure about like, should I follow gut and intuition? And like, I could tell you every time I made a decision that went against gut and intuition, I was wrong. And so I'm a huge believer in gut and intuition. And um, and I was kind of happy to hear Mark kind of review this. I forgot what, they, what you guys called it, but uh, the scientific method of hypothesis. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. And um, And I think a lot of the business books and like kind of cool marketing words wreck some of these ideas, at least is my point of view. So like people talk about um, fail fast. You know, I personally don't like that term. I mean, I like what it's supposed to do, but I think you have to put that term in context. So you, what you really want to do is create a hypothesis of how you see the world and how you think what you're going to innovate or do is going to improve that world. And you're really trying to create a hypothesis that you believe in. You're not trying to fail, but you use data you go out and talk to people in the world. Uh, and, and that was also great that, that you guys were talking about that in the beginning, beginning. I mean, you talk to customers, you talk to competitors, you talk to analysts, you talk to other tech providers, you just talk to everyone. But you create this hypothesis and then you go test it. And then you go test your hypothesis in the market, you collect more data and you, uh, and you do A-B testing and you continually improve your idea and your innovation and your hypothesis. So it is failing fast, but it's not the objective. It's the, you know, you're trying to achieve, but what you're doing is you're learning what's not working by, you know, uh, you know, creating a prototype or having a hypothesis, testing it, improving it, talking and iterating on that. So um, I, I always like to make a distinction around that. And then the other thing that I like to make a distinction around is MVP, minimal viable product. It's like, uh, maybe it's just a personal thing for me. I, it's another thing that I, I think is misused in the industry. And, um, and so people say, oh, just create a minimal viable product. But guess what? If, if you're actually starting a company and you create a minimal viable product and it doesn't have competitive advantage and you're going to start to put sales and marketing behind something, it, it's a bad idea. And so when we look at, when we do things, it's like, no, you have to first have a hypothesis of, um, of something that's gonna add value to the market. And then you have to go and talk to customers and talk to peers and talk to everyone about it. Then you have to go test it, but you have to clearly define why you have competitive advantage over what's already in the market, you know, or said another way, you know, why are you adding value to it? And so um, I'm a big believer in MVP. The definition is, is, is okay, but add to it that you are delivering additional value or and competitive advantage to what's in the market. So, um, so I guess some, some other things that, uh, that I've learned along the way and um, is how important having conviction around your idea is and, um, and having grit to kind of punch through all the barriers that, that you have to go through. So like everyone, everyone hears a lot of the, like great successes in the, in the world, but 99% of the rest of us, which is most of the world, there's a thousand barriers you have to punch through and you have to have that conviction and that grit to keep doing it, staying out of it and um, to realize your product, your innovation, your vision. And, and hand in hand with that goes with just this openness to keep learning and that the, the curiosity because if you don't keep learning all along the way and be open to ideas and listen to people because you want to do build the best product, um, it, it's just a critical trait to be successful. And um, so that's another uh, like important point uh, that I wanted to share. And then, because I'm, I'm in the tech space and we build software, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, big tech and how can you compete against them and 
how can you make decisions and um so the, the, the challenge that we all have today is big tech is keeps getting bigger they have they get they have a lot of talent they keep hiring more talent they have huge sales marketing and r d uh resources and capability they get all the press and um and they learned how to do things in an agile way so no longer can you say oh they're a big company they're slow moving sometimes they are but no they've learned agile ways and um but i gotta tell you we can't just leave it to big tech to innovate or to create better solutions in the world because they won't do it and it's up to us to do it and so um you know have the courage and the perseverance and grit to go do to go compete um because there's really no choice today. You have to compete against these big tech companies. And, and you have a choice. I mean, the best choice is when there's um, a green field, you know, a problem in the market, no one's really solved or big tech hasn't solved or they're not in there. So those are, those are, the, best, those are the best problems or the best um, areas in market to go in where there's just a green field you don't have um, fierce competition. You don't have to compete against tech. And that's the ideal situation. Now, those are those are hard to, to come up with. And if you do, God bless you. That's awesome. The other, uh, the other decisions you have is you could add value on top of the big, you know, a big company's um, current product. And that's kind of the fastest path to money, the fastest path to revenue. And um, it's easily uh, accepted in the market. You're adding value to something already in the market. The problem with that is every time they release a new version of their software, you're like sweating. You're like, oh my God, you know, I added value to it. And now they just added that feature and there goes your revenue stream and there goes everything. So while it is the fastest path to money, there, there is, um, you know, it's fraught with, with danger. The, the third way is, um, which does take a lot of courage, is that you see a problem in the market that big tech or some large competitors not really solving, but you, it's a huge market, but you have to build the, the baseline technology that is the same as what's already in the market. But then where you saw um, competitive advantage and where you saw differentiation and where you saw opportunity to solve additional problems or go at it in a different way. That's a really, uh, that's a great way to build a sustainable lasting company. Now it's scary because you takes a, it takes a lot of investment to build a baseline to, you know, just to compete against what the big tech already has or big company already has, but you have to have a, a novel innovation, not novel, but a good innovation to build on top of it. So it's, it's not always easy where like, Sometimes it's a long road. You have to build the technology that is the same, but then you can start adding your um, your innovation and your competitive advantage. And then, because it's such a big market, you can win market share and you can build a sustainable organization. So I thought, you know, those are kind of three different ways to uh, to look at that. So I want to kind of wrap up with um, maybe sharing my screen here. We, we created this innovation lab and um, I just want to share why we created the Innovation Lab. And it is, um, you know, it, it's actually just internal for Infragistics, but I thought I'd share it because I think it, it's, it, it's important to hear why we did it. And um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully you guys Dean, are uh, seeing my screen. Dean, Dean, do we have a couple of questions? Do you want to ask them now or after your Innovation Lab? Discussion? Oh, you can ask them now, yeah. Okay, um, so Ken, do you want to ask your question? You have a couple of questions, so maybe you can ask them. You can unmute if you want. Oh, tricky. Okay, now you go back because the threaded. <laughs> uh, one of the things was just, a, I guess, a specific one. Hey, okay, so far, great. This is awesome. So thank you for uh, for sharing. Does uh, Infogistics have any relation or support to the uh, credit union industry, federal credit unions and banks? Well, we, we have, um, we, we don't have like a, direct relationship with like the credit unions themselves, but like we're, we're selling to all the, the banks and, and, and their dev teams to build the soft, to build software that, that service it. So, uh, so indirectly we have relationships with them, or if it's, 
Um, I don't know if it's a, a direct credit union. If we have as a customer, we have a lot of customers. Um, I know our, our bigger customers, but I'll, maybe there's a follow on question to that. Uh, well, there, there may be. I, I was just thinking of that as you were speaking, just because the, you talk about market share and, and needs. A lot of credit unions going to third party vendors who actually at that point might be using some of your tools as well um, on uh, insurance and other, other platforms and financial services to, to sort of host their, uh, you know, a lot of credit unions don't have great front end um, platforms for you know, digital banking. Yes. The big banks, the big banks, you know, you can, you can do you know, 30,000 things. The smaller ones are still surprisingly lagging on, on some of their applications. So that was just a sort of a side question. Yeah, well, what, what we're doing for that is like companies that may not have as many resources as like a large bank um, within Indigo, which is our digital application design platform. We have the, uh, there's, there's something called design systems, which um, a design system is represents colors, fonts, UI patterns, screens, all the things that you want to build um, really easy to use applications. And um, so we've created this design system and we have templates like for the banking industry, templates for the insurance industry where you can take um, these kind of app templates, pull them into Indigo and change them, modify them or just reuse them as um, a way to kind of, uh, you know, have those templates to build a financial service application. And we're doing it for different industries. And um, it's in our it's in our dev team now. Like, so it's, you can't get it from our website just yet, but you will be able to in like um, one month. Um, but yeah, we sell to a lot of startups. We sell to a lot of companies that don't have huge dev teams. And we sell to people that may not have design and dev teams. And, um, and, and so we're trying to help them build great experiences faster. Great, great, thanks. And I see Khan, you put in a bunch of the uh, links, awesome. My, my second question flipped the script a little bit too is, and I think you might've answered it a little bit on the Greenfields aspect, you know, guide directions on where students may be able to look or explore. I mean, uh, I would imagine a lot of times people find um, needs and uh, sort of uh, gaps in, in what's being provided by their own, you know, experiences. But is there any any other place you'd suggest students to sort of explore, whether it's uh, blogs or innovation hubs and things like that as well? Yeah, I mean, and I mean, first it comes down to like you have an idea, so that's your hypothesis. You have this idea, and then um, how do you get ideas? Well, it's kind of what you said, which is like you have to be out and about. Like, uh, you know, certainly you can use your browser and um, investigate. You know, what are what are other companies doing? What are the big tech doing and, and kind of get insight there you can you know attend a lot of industry conferences that's always really useful um, to collaborate and talk to others talk to customers talk to and just talk to a lot of people to um, vet your idea and, and and really it's you know you're you're kind of like visualizing what you see in patterns out there and and you're always kind of building on things that are have already has, has already in the market but you're putting a lot of different uh, patterns you're observing in the market together to solve some new problem. And so, um, yeah, my advice is to, you know, first come up with your idea or, or if you're trying to do idea, you know, if you're going just through the ideation phase where you don't really have the idea yet, it's, it's using the web, looking at what's already in the market. It's going to conferences. It's talking to a lot of people, customers, analysts, competitors to formulate, you know, and not your idea. And then, then go validate it. Like, um, you know, we, like for, I'll give you, for example, when we invest in our different marketing channels to create awareness and help the buyer's journey uh, through the whole customer funnel, the customer journey, like I don't give our teams all our budget. Like they get money to experiment in the different marketing channels. And so when they find out how we can get our best ROI, then we load it up with more money um, to go do that. And so it's really the same thing in innovation and product development as well. It's like, you know, you have your hypothesis, don't spend a lot of money and time, just keep vetting it and improving it and testing it. And, and then we start building confidence and then you put more resources and more money into doing it. So it's, it's really that same approach. Thank you. Thank you.
You want to share your slide, Dean? Oh yeah, am I? Are you seeing my screen or no? Not yet. No. Not yet. Oh okay. Hold on. I thought I was sharing it. Okay. Share screen one. Well, that's weird. Why isn't it sharing it? Oh, here we go. Sorry. Share. Okay. So uh, are you? What yep. are you seeing? Are you Welcome to the Infrastructure yep. Innovation Lab. Yeah. Yep. So what we did was um, we created this in a, you know this innovation lab and. Um, and why did we do it? Because here, here's what happens. When you have a product in market, you, you, it really slows you down. Uh, one, you're, um, you're fixing bugs. Two, your customers are asking for incremental features. So you need to do that. And, and, so, and, and you're like really driven by sales and marketing and to, to have growth that way. And, so we created the innovation lab at Infogistics so that you can have a hypothesis, have an idea. And after you vetted it in some of the things I was talking about here, you, you, you clearly articulated and painted the picture of the future. You've gone out and collaborated and talked to customers and internal people at Infogistics. Then we give a space. It's really creating a space where you can work on that idea and not have the pressures of, um, of revenue and, and being in the market. And so, um, so we created this innovation lab and we've actually funded over $50 million worth of investment um, through this, but it's really creating that space for our team. And then, you know, and, and we kind of put Rutgers in here as well, because, you know, Rutgers is so, you know, into the in entrepreneur and innovation. And, and this is kind of like our innovation process, you know, idea, um, you know, create the, you know, articulate it, paint that picture share and collaborate internally, test it with a prototype, and then start like building it. And so some of the things that we've put through our innovation lab is Indigo Design, which is a low code uh, design to code system. And, um, and we're, we're really innovating there. I mean, um, and so that's one product. Another is uh, our embedded analytics. We built an embedded analytic tool for software companies and enterprises that they can take and just embed and have um, machine learning. They can have dashboards that have connections to all of these different, um, oops, sorry, that's mine. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and, um, and, and so it's this whole embedded analytic uh, product. And then what we're in pre-market uh, with um, is Slingshot, which is a digital collaboration platform that um, I wanted to, now we're not, we're, we're about to enter public preview in the next month or two, but if anybody, if, if you go to this Slingshot app.io, um, even though we're not in market, we're, we're kind of building out the website and the product, you can go and you can um, download it um, and start using it. And um, we have a freemium model. So like, even if you start using it, once we start charging, you'll still be able to use it for free. But, you know, I encourage that as well. And, um, and then the last thing that I wanted to share was, um, was really about uh, what we call the Infragistics way. And, um, and I think it's like useful and you guys can borrow this, but it's on um, infragistics.com about us. And what, what's the Infogistics way? It, it describes the practices that guide our actions, decisions. It's who we are, it's who we wanna be, and it's essential to our success. And so when you read these value statements or, you know, oh, we, we, we're, we're uh, you know, we, we're, we're trustworthy, we're, um, you know, we'll delight our customer. Like what, what this is doing, if you go to this website and read it, it's really kind of given a more prescriptive way of, um, of how to create a culture that can innovate and can compete. And so like, you know, I'll just kind of go through it really briefly, do the right thing always, uh, be fanatical about response, delight the customer, be curious and innovative. And, and then, you know, what does that mean? And we say what it means and, you know, check your ego, be data driven, bring it every day, show grit, um, make craftsmanship personal, um, practice blameless problem solving. Look from the outside in, which is so important. So many times people solve problems from the inside out. And that's like, you're not, you, you know, you really want to look from the inside, um, the outside in. And anyways, I wanted to just share this with you guys because um, 
I think all of these are attributes of innovation and how to create, you know, great teams that will innovate. And, and, and then you may have different ones that are more meaningful to you, but, um, but I wanted to share this with you guys on the topic of innovation because um, it, it's really, um, it's kind of foundational it, because innovation and teamwork and, and, and um, being an innovate, uh, being an inventor and solving problems, it, it kind of like encapsulates all of this. So, so I wanted to kind of end, you know, wrap up with that and, uh, and, you know, we can go to more questions now. If anybody has a question, you can either put it in the chat or go on mute, whichever you're comfortable doing. But I, I put in the chat, Dean, I love the, the practice blameless problem solving because it's really, you know, it's about getting, moving your innovation forward and getting ahead. It doesn't matter if you made a mistake or whatever, just move forward and take it to the next level. I think that's really, really good. So many people will never admit they made a mistake or did something wrong, but it doesn't help you move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it also creates trust too. You know, if like, if, if you, if you, if there was a problem and then somebody really gave you a hard time about that, like the next time you're not going to share it so uh, openly and um, which is not healthy and not good for any company. And so creating that environment of, um, okay, yeah, we, we all, have, we, there's always problems and we have to just keep solving them. Uh Dean, I have a question. Um, so we sometimes see innovations where there's a lot of, there's already a lot of other um, similar products on the market already. And so there's a lot of competition and there are, you know, the big names sometimes. And, um, and so how, how, when do you, how do you know when to just throw your hands up and, and just give up because like, oh, the big guys got it already. Or when do you know when to push forward and be like, I can do it better. How do you know when to decide that? Yeah. So I think it starts before you even start, which is that you see what they're doing and you see the direction they're heading in. And, um, and you, your idea is really valuable to the market and better than what they're doing. And so um, like we did that with Slingshot, like I could tell you two thirds of our, of our own employees and our board, no one believed we can compete against Microsoft and probably still some of them don't believe it, but, we have a lot of conviction around it. So it really starts first with um, why do you think you're going to add more value to the market than what they're doing? And so if you, if you can't answer that, mm. then you shouldn't start. And, um, and, then, and then it's just the road of hard knocks because no one stands still. They keep advancing their product, but it takes like a lot of courage and, um, and perseverance and conviction in the idea. And like I said, like some of like the big markets, it takes time to build a product that's like baseline where you're not actually at the point where you're showing that competitive advantage, but you have to have that roadmap and vision. And that's why you start and do it, you know? And so, um, you know, that, that's how, that, that, that's how I, you know, answer that question. So when do you throw the towel in? I mean, I mean, if, if you really, your ideas, if you, you know, you, you don't think that what you're doing is going to have uh, an advantage in the market or, and value to customers. That makes but sense. a lot of times, like if you have a lot of investment there, you pivot a little bit, you know, and, and it, it's a very organic and dynamic, everything's so dynamic. So it's sometimes it's not just quitting, but it's like, okay, you've built up assets and, and, and now you have to just keep, uh, you know, adjusting to market conditions. But I would say this, what's really important to know if you're not, if you're, if you're on the sidelines, you're never going to win, you know, you're just never going to win. And it's just scary to get in the game and it's always scary, but that's where courage comes in. It's doing things that you're afraid when, when you're afraid, you know, it's like, you just got to keep going for it and keep thinking and doing. That's why, like when we started like Mark and, and Connie and Lori, like, oh, what, what should we call it? It's like, you know, I, I forgot the exact order of the words, but it's like, you know, think do create learn and just keep doing it you know yeah that's great so dean did you, you create slingshot or did your did infragistics create slingshot because you saw a need in the market that there was you know the productivity tools that were out there didn't solve like your company's needs yeah that's exactly why because we saw everyone 
even Gartner was defining uh, productivity tools as whatever big tech came out with. So I don't know if you know this, but like Gartner says, oh, uh, like four or five years ago, pro collaboration and productivity is about uh, video conferencing and screen sharing, right? But is that really what teamwork's about? It's a part of teamwork. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden there's chat. Oh, the co collaboration and team performance and where work gets done is in chat. No, that's a piece of it, right? Yeah, modern communication for sure. Um, you know, video chat for sure, communication for sure. And now it's starting to incorporate task management, project management. So now they're saying that. But um, so what we saw was all these point solutions. And what we were caring about was like, how can we have, how can we have create, have business teams get extraordinary results? How can you drive to have a higher performing team and have growth in your company? And so that was like our thesis, which is like, okay, there's nothing in the market that like really is trying to, you know, have the essence of driving uh, high performing teams. And so like our thesis is like, you have a, you can run a high performing team. Like, okay, trust is a really important, we're, we're helping with trust a little bit, you know, not all the way, but, but people that are getting extraordinary results are they're making decisions with data. So we, ha we have data analytics built into the platform. People that um, set goals and objectives and, and give autonomy to execute, which I, I was kind of talking about here, where you, you directionally set people, everyone knows the goal or objective, so they can make decisions, they have autonomy to execute. And when you give people autonomy to execute, you get intrinsic mm -hmm. motivation, you, you get innovation, because then people think of new ways to solve the problem and you're happy because, well, it's gonna achieve the goal or direction. So that's another core philosophy in Slingshot, you know, alignment, setting goals and, um, and strategies. And then the other is keeping everyone in the know. And, um, and, and so these are like all really core and then, and then creating a culture of accountability. And sometimes people say, oh, well, we have accountability, but like accountability is not just someone being accountable. It's when you ask someone to do something, do they clearly understand what you want them to deliver? So it helps the communication and like, what do you want them to do? When do you want them to do it? What does it look like when it's done? Oh, maybe they don't know how to do it. It gives space to like tell them how to do it, teach them. So all these principles we incorporated into Slingshot and basically like functionally what Slingshot is, it's a digital collaboration platform that integrates content management, chat, data analytics, task and project management, discussions, or all on a, you know, modern, you know, simple and beautiful uh, experience. And, um, and, and so yeah, that, that's why we're, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of money and time going to market with Slingshot. And it kind of, uh, you know, what I talked about in my talk, it's like, I, I'm sharing what we're living, you know? So like people are saying every day saying to me, well, why are we diverting resources from our UX and UI tools? We're doing so well there. And, um, oh, why do you think you can compete against Microsoft Teams? And why do you think, you know, it's like, well, well man, you know, have you used Teams? Like, people, you know, or it's Asana. Just, you know, Asana it's is Microsoft, another Microsoft, you know, yeah. it's like, it's just like, oh, well, and, and so there's every day I deal with naysayers, you know, and, um, but I'm, but, you know, we're going to win, you know, it, it's that conviction. And, uh, and it's a hundred billion dollar market, like, oh, well, are we going to stay in, in niche markets and, you know, that, and technology keeps changing. So we're always running. Uh, but, but these are all the things that, you know, hopefully I shared in my talk to, to people well, on the, I'm seeing on the even though you've been around a really long time, you still have that innovator's passion and that entrepreneur's, you know, drive and energy. Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We're over time, but we do have two more questions. Are you willing to stay for, for two more oh, yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so Tolo, uh, Tolo, you're you're first. If you want to go off mute, I'm gonna let you ask your question of Dean. Yeah, um, I just um, wanted to ask, um, like in a B2B model, like what are some of the things that you evaluate for the price point for your licenses? So like maybe similar to Canvas or um, Blackboard that license their product to universities to use. Um, yeah. So that was just my question. Yeah, it's really hard. Pricing is so important and it's so hard. So I could just share how we do it, which, and, and then and then it does become trial and error. So like, here's how we price Slingshot, for example. We, um, we, we could charge so much more for Slingshot, but we're not going to. Um, but 
you look at competition and you look at what their price points are. We also have a freemium model in Slingshot and it's really hard to, it's like a Goldilocks problem. It has to be just right. Like what's the right free features? What's the right, you know, paywalls for people to upgrade. And um, so we look at competition. We look at um, how the customer will see value. And then we also look at, um, you know, how can we, how can we uh, have viral what are the features in the product that have viral? And also, does price inhibit viral? So we made sure that price doesn't inhibit viral both in the features. Like you can always use it free. Like if you paid for Slingshot subscription and you want to collaborate with somebody, yeah, you can always collaborate with people because you get two free workspaces. Always free. So it doesn't inhibit your own usage. And um, and then we look at, um, you know, okay, if somebody somebody's going to buy for their team, um, it's this price point and, th and they'll buy it, but then how do you kind of expand out into the organization? And so do you want to make it easy to, for them to buy a license when it's, uh, maybe only and not an edge case, but they only need it, at, you know, for some piece of the value. And it's a very tricky, difficult thing to price your product. Right. And, um, and, and, and what's really important in pricing your product is to understand, um, reoccurring revenue, the lifetime value of a customer and churn in your customer base. So these are all business models you go through and it all starts with average selling price, which is your, what you're asking about the price point. But like what's great about software is like, oh, okay, well, we're going to charge a hundred dollars a year, but the lifetime value of the customer is 10 years. So it's really, you know, a thousand dollars per customer that we acquire. And, um, and so that drives how much money you might spend to acquire a customer. And, and then what's the churn, you know, um, you know, how, how many people are you going to lose annually? And then how do you backfill that and then drive new, new business, new seats so that you do have growth as a business, but yeah, pricing is, is hard and it's so important. Um, thanks. That's, that's a great, great uh, feedback on that. Uh, Jada, do you want to ask your question now? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, my question is for introverted and technical innovators with a lot to offer. Um, what's the best way to market yourself as an entrepreneur or like market your, your product without uh, putting too much pressure on masking your personality? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, you can think through how you want your product seen, how you define value, what your key messages are and the problems you're solving with your product. You can think quietly through all that. And then you can express that through, uh, you know, your website copy and videos and, and, and that. So like you could be in the background orchestrating all this, you know, go to market messaging and value and communication. And then, you know, I'm a big believer in simple and beautiful. And so that like, you probably want to get a designer involved you want it to be beautiful, and um, and and so I mean, that that's what I would recommend. It, you know, in terms of like speaking, um, you know, through digitally speaking. But then if you have to go and um, pitch and talk to people and do that, well, um, yeah, it's courage. Like you have to have some courage. Like you know, you have to do it. Like you can't not do it. And um, and the best thing to do is is prepare. Like um, you know, prepare your main key points. And um, that way you feel really confident in your conversation and you have that. And um, so, so, so that, 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 I guess that, that's my, my answer. And it gets better with time, Jada, the more times you do it. And if you're prepared, you, it gets much easier. Nobody likes talking at first, but once you do it again and again and again, you become much more comfortable and we say you don't grow unless you stretch yourself outside your comfort zone. Yeah, and, and I tell you all, we have a lot of introverts, cr amazingly creative introverts. And um, and I always work like in a meeting to call, like I think everyone should talk, you know? And so I always call them and like, you have to share your idea or your thought. Like you, you're so smart and you we all have to benefit from your point of view. Now, maybe no one, you know, maybe we don't agree with it, but it's still a smart point of view, you know? And so it's, uh, yeah. It, 
And uh, one thing, Jada, I put it in the chat there, of apply for the fellowship, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, have, uh, you know, people who really are innovators, but they're, they don't have a team and they kind of like are individuals. They really learn how to communicate better and how to interact with the other people. And over the course of the i program, you really uh, learn a lot uh, about, and most people get a lot of confidence. So that way you don't have to mask anything. Like you just be yourself, like, uh, like Dean said earlier, but you're able to do it with confidence and, uh, you know, don't worry about what people will think because you're really trying to get down to the bottom of what the problem is. It's like you're a problem solver. Yeah. So you, it's right like on. you're you're on a mission to help solve this problem. Right. Yeah. And, and just to highlight that. Yeah. Just be yourself. I mean, it doesn't really matter. You're just being authentic. Just be yourself. Don't be someone else. And um, and like Mark said, like it, you'll you, you'll people will see that you're really passionate about your idea that they'll read your body language and if they'll, they'll know if you're nervous or not but everyone gets nervous and but like you just it, it's just being yourself and communicating what you you know really what you care about uh, and you're right dean about calling on people because it's so important to get everybody's ideas and, and and you you may miss somebody who's an introvert who isn't willing to share unless you call on them and try to get them to to speak because they do have great ideas they just may be shyer about it and they often have better ideas than, than those of us who are outspoken, who are always yeah. talking all the time. No doubt about that. Well, of course, you have to learn to listen. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're, we're way over time, but Dean, I want to thank you so, so much for sharing all these um, great, great information about, you know, infragistics and your, your history, your past and how, um, how you see innovation at your company. I love some of the mantras that you, you have there. Um, and some of them, they, they really do align with i about customer discovery and delighting the customer. Um, so I, again, I really appreciate, you know, everything you've done for Rutgers in terms of providing the software and, and also giving this talk today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lori, and thank you guys. Great having you, thank you. Thank you, Dean, so much. Okay, bye, bye everyone. Bye. All right. Bye. Care, thanks. Thanks, Dean. Thanks for the intro, Connie. You're welcome. My pleasure.